And so with your copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Let me just welcome those of you who are viewing online. Uh, thank you for joining us online, but we want to invite you to join us in person. Uh, there's nothing better than the gathered body of believers in Jesus Christ. And so if you're watching us, we want to invite you to be here every Sunday at 11 o'clock. I saw a movie recently which described the events leading to the housing market collapse in 2008. Uh, the movie entertainingly explained the circumstances which led to the housing collapse and that season of national economic recession. In layman's terms, the banks were lending money to people for mortgages that didn't have the means to pay back on those houses. People with no credit, people with poor credit, People with hit and miss paychecks. Banks were loaning money to people that they shouldn't have. And on the other side of that crash, and looking back in hindsight, we can say, of course it was going to fail. When people begin to default on their mortgages, everyone feels the weight of that. Foreclosures and short sales occurring in large scale drive the housing market down. Not to mention the fact that Wall Street invested in mortgage-backed securities that they deemed too secure to fail. So all of it makes sense now. And how come no one could see the problem before it happened? There were a handful of people who saw the issues and bet against the housing market, but on the whole, they were the exceptions. Why could no one see that these lending and investment practices were going to lead to an economic disaster on a national scale? Why? Pride. Pride. The banker's pride led them to extend financing to unqualified people in the interest of growing their investment portfolios. The investor's pride led them to believe that nothing could ever happen to investments that were backed by the housing market. The Securities and Exchange Commission's pride led them to believe that this couldn't happen on their watch. The homeowner's pride led them to accept adjustable rate mortgages, after all, because they deserved the American dream too. Everyone believed, like nothing, everyone believed that nothing like that could ever happen to them. Everyone had it all figured out. So why did the housing market collapse? Pride. Pride is the root of all kinds of evil. It was the reason Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. And it's the reason one of their sons would be kicked out of the Lord's presence. Read with me beginning in verse 1. The man was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have a male child. I've had a male child with the Lord's help. And she also gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. Let me just stop there. In essence, Eve exclaims, God made man, and now with the help of the Lord, I have made the second man. That's in essence what she's saying. Her commentary on the birth of the child reflects her renewed dependence on the Lord. Eve had a rekindled faith in the goodness of God and in the veracity of his word. And it appears that Cain is the first child Eve conceived and Abel the second. Most commentators agree on that, but let me just point out, that's, we don't know that for sure. Genesis 5-4 makes it clear that Adam had other sons and daughters. A Jewish historian Josephus notes that the number of Adam's children says the old tradition was 33 sons and 23 daughters. And while that's a helpful number attributed to tradition, it can be re we need to be reminded that Cain and Abel weren't the only two or even necessarily the first two. These two verses happen over two decades in time. Cain is at least a year older than his brother. Further, verse 2 indicates that they were now working as a shepherd and as a farmer, which means they must have been at least teenagers at this point. In verse 3... In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of the flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. And Cain was furious, and he looked despondent. Both men presented offerings to the Lord from their respective vocations. Cain presented some of the land's produce... Abel presented some of the firstborn of his flock in their fat portions. Abel brought the fattest of the firstlings of his flock. Abel gave God his best. He went out of his way to please God. 
In contrast, his brother simply discharged a duty. His brother simply checked the religious box. And in response to their worship, God recognized the value of Abel's offering and not Cain's. And as we'll see, Cain took issue with that. Cain was furious. He looked despondent. And the Lord calls him out on this in verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious? And why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. If you, don't, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? This reminds us of Micah 6, 8, this idea of doing right. Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. If you act justly, and you love faithfulness, and you walk humbly with God, won't you be accepted? But the implication of God's question is that Cain isn't just. He isn't faithful, and he isn't humble. His offering won't be accepted because he is not accepted. It's not good enough to do the right things. You have to have faith. Faith leads to doing the right things with the right motivation. And as I said in the sermon on giving a few weeks ago, God is after your heart, not after your money. The anger which Cain displayed was not the response of a humble believer. And not only did Cain fail to do what was right, but there was a greater temptation that was lurking nearby. The temptation hiding in the shadows, the temptation ready to pounce. Temptation that wants to master and rule over you. But you need to recognize it for what it is, and you need to rule over it. Because what was true for Cain is true for us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also provide a way out so that you may be able to bear it. Cain was not tempted beyond anything uncommon to you or I. And Cain was not tempted beyond what he was able to withstand. In fact, God was poking him in the chest about his anger was actually a kindness. He was trying to make Cain aware of his sinful disposition in order to provide him a way out of sin. But instead of taking the way out of sin, Cain persists in it. In verse 8, Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Eve had to be talked into her sin. Cain could not be talked out of his. Despite the warnings from the Lord, Cain was ruled by sin. Sin was crouching at the door. His desire, its desire was to rule over Cain. And guess what? Sin got what it wanted. It got the best of Cain. And now Adam and Eve's, one of Adam and Eve's children is laying dead in the field. And just like when God approached Cain's dad in the garden, God approached Cain in the field. And just like with his dad, he asked the question he already knows the answer to. In verse 9, he asked this, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? Now, rather than own his own sin, Cain tries to play games with God. He lies about Abel's whereabouts, and then he gets passive-aggressive with God and tries to correct God with the question, Am I my brother's keeper? Cain was sassing God. As we would say in North Carolina, he was sassing God. But that's not going to go unchecked. And in verse 10, God says, What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed, alienated from the ground, that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood you have shed. If you work the ground, it will never again give, it, give you its yield. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. One commentator says this is the mo one of the most monumental sentences in all of the Bible. The most important words being to me. It's not an empty sentence that the blood of the victim cries out. There is someone to whom the blood cries out. God has leveled the boom here. Cain's sin has not gone unnoticed, has not gone unpunished. God has cursed Cain to be a restless wanderer for the remainder of his days. The job of farming he once had will no longer be his provision. God fired Cain from his job. Cain's sass has now been replaced with sobriety. And in verse 13, he says this, My punishment is too great to bear. 
since you are banishing me today from the face of the earth, and I must hide from your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord replied to him, In that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. And then Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Master sin before it masters you. That is our main idea this morning. Master sin before it masters you. The Lord moves quickly from accusation to judgment, which makes sense. Cain didn't offer any hope that he was going to give some kind of an apology. And the story flows like this. Cain's birth, followed by Abel's. Abel's occupation, followed by Cain's. Cain's offering, followed by Abel's. Abel's acceptance, followed by Cain's rejection. Cain's anger, followed by Abel's death. And Abel's death, followed by Cain's judgment. Cain went out from the Lord's presence, settled in the land east of Nod, and in verse 17, Cain was intimate with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain became the builder of a city, and he named the city Enoch after his son. Irad was born to Enoch. Irad fathered Mahaluel. Mahaluel fathered Methuselah. Methuselah fathered Lamech. Lamech took two wives for himself, one named Ada and the other named Zilhah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the first of the nomadic herdsmen. His brother named Jubal was the first of all who played the lyre and the flute. Zillah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. Tubal Cain's sisters was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Pay attention to my words, for I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then Lamech it will be seven times. Adam was intimate with his wife, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has given me another offspring in the place of Abel, since Cain killed him. A son was born to Seth also, and he named him Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Let's deal with the obvious question up front. Is Cain's concern valid? He makes the statement, whoever finds me will kill me. But how is that possible? Who else would have been around to kill Cain? I thought it was just him and Abel. But I want you to notice in verse 3 of today's text, the author begins the verse by making the comment, in the course of time. Some time had elapsed since the birth of Cain and the birth of Abel. We need not assume that because these verses are in sequential order that they occur in a short period of time. Some time had elapsed between Cain and Abel's birth and the sacrifices they make in verse 3. In Genesis 5, we learn that Adam fathered many sons and daughters. In fact, in Genesis 5, 3, Adam was 130 years old when he fathered Seth. Seth is seen as the replacement for Abel. And it's through Seth's line that the Messiah would be traced. If we assume that they gave birth to a child every other year, this being Adam and Eve, they would have given birth to 65 children by the time that Adam reached 130 years old. And if we assume that their children don't start marrying each other until they reach 20 years of age, then the first two children who marry could have given birth to about 56 grandchildren by the time Adam and Eve reach 130 years. The second two children could have given birth to 55 grandchildren, and the next two children could have also given birth to 65, 55 grandchildren. And if we continue counting at that rate and with those assumptions, we discover that Adam and Eve's children could have given birth to 1,536 grandchildren. And if you factor in the children of the great-grandchildren, Adam and Eve could have been responsible for a conservative estimate of 10,000 people walking the earth by the time they were 130 years old. So why was Cain afraid of wandering? Why was he fearful? For the other 10,000 family members that would have avenged Abel's death. God protected the life of the rebellious brothers so that he could live in the world, but now he would do so apart from God's blessing. In the Levitical law, there's a statute referred to as the lex talionis, better known as an eye for an eye. In other words, the punishment should be commensurate with the offense. But in this case, God actually extends grace to Cain. 
He doesn't sentence Cain to the death penalty for the life that he took from Abel. And not only does he not take a life for a life, but he prohibits anyone else from doing the same. He places a mark on Cain and issues the threat of divine vengeance seven times over. Now many have conjectured about the mark of Cain. Uh, the type of mark is not important. No one really knows what it was. The mark itself represents the grace of God. On some level, uh, grace to Cain's offspring as well. They were the recipients of God's grace. I want you to think about this. The fact that Cain didn't receive the death penalty for his sins allows his offspring even to be born, which is a grace of God. A common grace extended to Cain's lineage, those who were far apart from God. A common grace extended to the entire world, who is far apart from God. But despite God's punishment, Cain still demonstrates his unwillingness to abide. God punished Cain for his sin. He told him that he would be a restless wanderer, but even in his punishment, Cain defies God. Instead of hitchhiking the earth for the rest of his days, what does he do? He builds a city. He builds a city. Nothing about a city says restless wanderer. Nothing conveys a greater sense of permanence than a walled city. Cain building a city is an act of defiance. But while Cain had received some measure of God's grace, he would spend the rest of his days apart from God's presence. Let me just say this. Perhaps the biggest punishment for Cain and for us would be to live a life and to die a death apart from God's presence. As with the parents, Adam and Eve, Cain moved east of the garden. To move east is to say away from the Lord's provision, away from the Lord's favor, and his fellowship masters sin before it masters you. There's so many doctrinal uh, lessons in this short story. The text makes it clear. We do have a responsibility for one another. We are not an island unto ourselves. We are our brother's keeper. Punishment of the guilty is foundational for a functioning society. Punishment of the guilty is foundation for a functioning home and a fun functioning society. Without God or his blessing, life is dangerous and without protection. I cannot imagine a worldview that doesn't include God. A world without God makes me the highest form of life. I'd like to think I've got some good attributes, that are beneficial for society, but I'm not ready to be God. A godless society is reduced to seeking compensation wherever it can find it. And finally, on the doctrinal, God's favor is an important element of this. God's favor rested on Abel, not Cain. The older brother was rejected in favor of the younger for the inheritance. Cain was unfaithful and rebellious and therefore disqualified. The line of blessing would flow through Abel's replacement, that is Seth. To Moses, God says this, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God's favor, Isaiah 66, 2, falls on those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at his word. Why? God's chosen people, because God chose them. Why is the church the bride of Christ? Because God chose them. God's favor rests on whom God chooses. But beyond these doctrinal implications from the text, how does this text hit us where we live? What is it calling us to do? Real simple this morning. Number one, do good. Do good. Master sin before it masters you. But how do you master sin? Faith. Faith in Jesus the Christ. Believe that apart from Christ we were dead in our sins. Believe that through Jesus we have victory over those sins. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave. And the promise of faith is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Faith is met with the sealing of the Holy Spirit. This very Spirit of God lives within you. You can master sin because the Spirit is helping you. And mastering sin is saying no to some things and saying yes to others. In Jesus' name, saying yes to doing good. Because like Eve exclaims in verse 1, good things come from the Lord. God gave a good garden. God gave the first family kids. God gave a ground that was yielding produce. God gave flocks to shepherd. God gave a knowledge of himself. God gave his creation an opportunity to worship. Good things come from the Lord. So do good. Do what is right and you will master sin. Worship God rightly with the right methods and the right motivations, and the right heart. The right methods of worship are important here. 
Some have conjectured that Cain's grain offering wasn't the appropriate offering to atone for sin, while Abel's blood sacrifice was. Perhaps Cain should have traded some of his grain to his brother and offered an animal in sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice to God. The right methods of worship are important. I've attended services in Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, non-denominational assemblies of God, Pentecostal settings. I've, I've been in it. My military experience uh, taught me that there was people that are doing it different ways, and I'm not endorsing any of those. Let me just say I've, I've attended churches of 15, churches of 10,000. In each one of those settings, I found something that was God-honoring, but each one of those settings, I found something that was not. But here are some things that I know to be true about rightly ordered worship. Right worship includes the gathering of the saints. Right worship includes prayers of adoration, confession, and thanksgiving and supplication. Right worship includes singing of spiritual songs and hymns, celebrating God, mourning our sin, confessing our belief, and pledging our obedience. Right worship includes the preaching of the whole counsel of God, not a self-help talk. Right worship includes the opportunity to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve Him, and to give to Him. Right worship always points to Jesus. Right worship always centers around his word. And right worship always includes the gospel. Right worship is never about the worshiper. It is always about the object of worship, God. We want to worship God in spirit and in truth. And the spirit inspired the very words of truth. So when you walk over that threshold and you came into these doors this morning, you are transitioning from the profane to the holy, from the secular to the sacred, from the common to the uncommon, from the earthly to the heavenly, worship God rightly. It's quite possible that Cain's offering was not acceptable based on the manner of his sacrifice. But beyond the method of worship, we know that the text that Cain's heart isn't following God. We need to worship God the right way and with the right heart. And the right heart is evidenced in Abel. Abel is praised in Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. The biblical setting is worship, and the factor that led to Abel's death was Cain's exaggerated pride. Like his parents before him, Cain desired a recognition that did not rightly belong to him. The deficiency of the gift revealed the deficiency of his heart. Cain's gift revealed his lack of faith. Cain's anger revealed his true heart. There are two kinds of people in worship. There are the Cains and there are the Abels. The Cains reject the Lord's advice. The Cains sin and then deny it. The Cains don't take responsibility for their sin. And then when they do reap the punishment, they protest it. The Abels worship God with their very best. Sacrifices are offered from a heart of faith, a heart which gives God the first and the best, not the leftovers. One brother pleased God and found acceptance. One brother, thinking of himself to be acceptable, was filled with envy and rage. Let me tell you this, the true test of our hearts is how we react to seeing ourselves as we truly are. If we are self-righteous, we will react like Cain did. Do good. Secondly, don't do bad. Don't do bad. Do the right things and avoid the bad things. Bad things come from sin. The virus of sin has infected the parents' children. Adam and Eve don't have to await their own death to experience the devastating effects of their rebellion in the garden. They witnessed the murder of their youngest and the exile of their firstborn. Sin led to Cain and Abel being born with a sin nature into a broken world and with parents whose sin had already cursed humanity with the promise of death. Sin led the once good pronouncement of the boys to now be undermined. Sin has spread from the garden. It spread into the family. It spread into society. Cain's sin came from an overflow of his heart. His faulty worship revealed a faulty heart. A faulty heart led to sin. And Abel, once healthy and following God, is now dead. Cain, once productive and with great potential, is now wandering the earth. The immediate fallout of sin, the residual effects of sin, sin is truly crouching at the door. Master your sins. Sin requires a purification. The homicidal blood would pollute the land. Shed blood cries out for vengeance. 
Abel's blood cries out to God day and night. It accuses, but it never brings salvation. Even as righteous, righteous as Abel is depicted in the New Testament, his blood could not cure the curse. Instead, its blood, his blood increases the burden of the curse. It's the only the shed blood of Jesus Christ that cures the curse. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the myriad of angels, a festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of the righteous people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel accuses. The blood of Christ brings healing. God is the keeper of the man who didn't want to be his brother's keeper. And in his sin, God provided a refuge for Cain. And in your sin, God has provided a refuge for you. The appeal of sin is powerful. It's persuasive. Its effects are pervasive. It seeks to enslave its victims. And God is calling out to you, what have you done? And he knows what you've done. This question is not a fact-finding mission, but a call for you to repent. Repent of your sin, lest you be consumed by it. Repent of your sin, lest you die in it. Repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out and that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So how many restless wanderers in here do we have today? Those who are still under the curse of sin. How many of you feel an unhealthy anxiousness? How many of you feel like your soul needs a fidget spinner? How many of you can't wait to get out of here right now? You have no sense of purpose. You do not know where you are, and you do not know where you're headed. You have no faith. And if you were to die today, you would die in your sin, eternally separated from God. You're a restless wanderer. To the restless wanderers, Jesus is calling. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, earnestly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home with every head bowed and every eye closed in this moment. You just heard the word of the Lord. You just heard the repercussions of sin. You've just been reminded that God does not turn a blind eye to sin, that all sin will be punished. But you've also been reminded of the grace of God that has been extended to Cain and has been extended to you in the person and work of Jesus Christ so this morning if you find yourself wandering please know that you don't have to wander anymore Jesus is calling calling for you to repent of your sins to turn away from those sins to quit persisting in those sins and to believe which is not a verb it's essentially to not call God a liar to believe that what he has said is true. To venture to trust this faith in Jesus Christ. Faith that's placed in what he did. Faith that places your weight on him. And if you will believe in your heart, believe in your heart, and confess with your mouth, the promise is that you will be saved. A work of God. Nothing that you can do to earn it. God's already done the heavy lifting. And all you have to do is believe. And in that belief, you receive the promised Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit that allows you to master sin because you cannot do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. You will fall flat on your face if you try to live the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit of God. It won't happen. But in faith, with the help of the Spirit, you can master sin and be conformed in the image of Jesus Christ. It is possible. So whether you've heard the gospel for the first time this morning, or whether you've heard the gospel for the 10,000th time,
the gospel is still true. The gospel is still good. The gospel is still calling us to obedience and to faith. This morning, if God has started something in your life, I, I want you to tell me about it. If God has convicted you of sin, I want you to turn from it. If God is calling you to obedience in some way, I want you to do it. And trust in God. The blood of Abel cries out. The blood of Jesus covers sin. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. I thank you for this church. I thank you for its commitments. I thank you for the families that are here. I thank you for its ministry. Father, we ask for your help. Leave this place to go out and be who you called us to be. To be a city on a hill, light in the dark, salt in a world that needs saltiness, needs your, needs your gospel. So God, would you help us in that endeavor this morning to be who we're supposed to be? In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand and worship with us. The praise team comes and we sing about Hey, welcome to King's Church. We're so glad that you're here with us. We are here to make disciples in Las Vegas who make King Jesus known in the world. And we do that by gathering, growing, and going. The best disciples are those who are serving inside the body or outside the body. So come join us for church on Sundays. Simple, relational, and biblical.